be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit. Grace and peace to you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our text this evening is from the epistle reading, verse 31. If God is for us, who can be against us? Dear fellow redeemed, the Old Testament reading says how people should be terrified because of God's impending judgment. It said, you said, no, for we will flee on horses, therefore you shall flee, and we will ride on swift horses, therefore those who pursue you shall be swift. One thousand shall flee at the threat of one, and at the threat of five you shall flee. Isaiah describes people running away in fear because of threats against them. And it sounds like political enemies or military enemies, people with whom they were at war, but really this is God threatening them. Their enemies were nothing more than instruments of God, raised up by God to punish them for their sins. In contrast to that in the Old Testament, the reading from Romans tells people they have nothing to fear. For I am persuaded that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. <laughs> the difference between the two passages lies in the difference of the people to whom God was speaking. In Isaiah, the people were rebellious and disobedient people. People who had gone after false gods of the world around them. See, they wanted to fit in with their neighboring cultures, so they turned away from the word of God, and they started adopting the false morals and principles of the godless nation around them. Isaiah warned them. He told them if they tried to fit in with the world around them, there'd be consequences if they didn't repent and turn back to God. But they ignored him. And they got exactly what Isaiah said. They got the wrath of God aimed right at them. In the epistle reading, the people to whom Paul was speaking were a very different kind of people. They had been idolaters at one point in their lives. And many people in this congregation were raised under false gods, but they had turned away from those gods. They repented of their sins and were devoted to the one true God, so they trusted in Christ for eternal life. I mean, granted, they still sin just like we do, but they had grace to forgive them their sins. <coughs> because they were redeemed, God assured them they had nothing to fear in this world, not life, not death, not supernatural powers, not even the anger of the world around them. Nothing could separate them from God's love. Now, we find ourselves in our day living in very similar circumstances. We live in the midst of idols. And all around us, all around us in the world, people are worshiping the false gods of this world. And those false gods are things like the god of self, the god of self-indulgence, the gods of power and money and hate and immorality. There's so many false gods in our world, and people flee to them. Every year that passes, our world becomes more idolatrous, more open in embracing the doctrines of demons. In fact, just in this past year, 2022, our own government passed a law that they call the Respect for Marriage Act, which is actually the exact opposite of respect for marriage. It's complete disrespect for the marriage that God created. And it protects and promotes homosexuality. And it threatens to punish anyone who says same-sex marriage is sinful. <coughs> and on top of that, this past year, we saw the rights of law-abiding citizens cut back. We saw criminals time and time again get off with slaps on the wrist. We watched libraries publicly promoting sexual perversity with their drag queen 
reading stories. We watch schools protect and promote the sexualization of their students and ignore what parents had to say. All of this are symptoms of the idolatry of our world. And without even knowing it, people all around us are worshiping these false gods, following the doctrines of demons. <coughs> As we end the old year and look at the year ahead, we are confronted with the exact same two paths that the ancient believers had to follow. The first path is to compromise with this world around us so that we might be liked better. Maybe accept a few of the arguments of secular society, relax a few of our doctrines so they're more palatable to the world. That was the path chosen by ancient Israel. And it led them into a wholesale rejection of God and his word. <coughs> And there is, sad to say, a part of us attracted to that. Because we all like being liked. We all like getting along with the world and having the world heap praises on us. We don't like conflict. Nobody likes conflict. So it's natural to kind of compromise in order to get along. Our sinful heart is always attracted to the praise of the world. Second path is harder. That path means suffering. That means being rejected by this world in which we live. And it might mean financial loss. It might mean not advancing in the workplace. That's the path that stands firm on God's word and confesses Christ even against an entire world. While our faith knows this is the right path, our sinful hearts shirk back from it because we don't like sacrifice and isolation. And yet, according to what God tells the Romans in our reading tonight, we shouldn't be afraid of walking this path. Because this is the path filled with God's love. And our God promises us protection from this world in which we walk. Like St. Paul says, if God is for us, who can be against us? To walk this second path isn't really our choice that we make. It's just living out our faith is all. It's being the people Jesus baptized us to be. And he put his Holy Spirit within us already in his word and at his sacraments so that his spirit might guide us in faith down this path so we can receive his holiness and his mercy and live it out in the world. And each week when we come here into his church, Jesus meets us again and supplies us with what we need. <coughs> He washes out the stains of this world's corruption that are left on us. He forgives us the totality of our sins and establishes us on that path once more. And it's through the church, through our constant reception of Jesus' forgiving grace, that we keep walking on this path God places us on. In the Gospel lesson, St. Luke describes this as, as waiting for the Master, let your waist be girded and your lamps burning and you yourselves be like men who wait for their master when he will return from the wedding, that when he comes and knocks, they may open to him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the master, when he comes, will find watching. So as we look at 2023 ahead of us, it's going to be a year of waiting and watching and living out our faith in a world increasingly hostile to Christ. It'll be a year when Christ's teachings and his people are attacked because of our beliefs and belittled by this world. But it will be another year in the hands of a gracious and loving God who controls all things and through whom we have nothing to fear. Because who can bring any charge against us as God's elect? God justifies us. And moreover, it is Christ who died and is risen, who is even now at the right hand of God making intercession for us. So who shall separate us from the love of Christ? No one. Nothing can. And with that assurance, we step forward into the next year, 
knowing we are thoroughly covered by God's grace, knowing we have Jesus' protection from all evil. So may he strengthen us to live out our faith as Christians ought in 2023. Amen. Now may the peace that surpasses all understanding keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.